Hello, Surreal fan. Things are getting tasty in the race for the Scudetto. Gasparini's got some Argentinian beef, Palmer hamper Milan's title aspirations, and Roma make mincemeat out of Bologna. Elsewhere, both Conte and Pirlo get their fill, and three squads get sent to bed without any Christmas dinner. And on a serious note, a tribute to Italian legend Paolo Rossi in this episode of Scudetto. Hi everyone, and welcome back to our virtual studio for the penultimate Scudetto episode of 2020. We have plenty of Serie A narrative to discuss as always, but first a few podcast announcements. Uh, first, a happy Hanukkah to you guys. Tell me, uh, are you having a happy Hanukkah? It's been uh, very sugary, so I guess very good. Sounds good to me. Uh, actually, since we're on you, do you want to um, do our other announcements since it's your uh, segment? Well, we're planning to bring back uh, Keeping Up With The Italians in 2021, particularly because all the Italian clubs qualified to the next round of their various competitions. Perfect. Seven new cities to talk about. <laughs> That's Almost all of the Italian teams. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, so for anyone that doesn't know, Keeping Up With The Italians is where we uh, preview the cities that the Italian teams <laughs> will be visiting. So it was very popular. Um, so back by popular demand next year. And what we're also bringing back is our Scudetto. Uh, so we want to hear from you, especially for this, this uh, special Christmas episode that's coming out next week. If you've got any questions you want to ask the pod, please send them in, tweet them at us, send us an email. Uh, we will be happy to try and answer them. So that's it for announcements. Uh, before we get on to the football, let's do some beer. Uh, Kenny, you've got a beer there. Yeah, yeah, I've got a beer. Uh, so you will remember uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, I had a beer by Dragate Brewing Company, which was called Disco Fork Lift Truck, uh, which prompted some ridicule from Boaz. So I've gone for another one of theirs because I quite enjoyed it. Uh, this one's called Crossing the Rubicon. It's a West Coast IPA, but I didn't check out the uh, the alcohol volume on it before buying it. So I've got a 6.9 percenter tonight which is, for me, a bit strong for a Monday night. But let's crack it open. Let's, uh, let's do this. Best of luck. It's what Buzz refers to as a proper beer. Uh, I think you've got a beer for us and a story as well, haven't you, Buzz? Well, I have two options. I literally, you might remember, I picked out a bunch of beers to celebrate Diego, and I guess they both have pretty nice labels, so I'm going to let you, one of you two pick it. So we've got one with an orange label, a Meltzer. It's a Meltzer and an education. One is a double dry hopped IPA and the other is a, just a pale ale. I like the, the one with a, a bold Antonio Conte. On the- yeah, I vote for bold Tony. I, haven't, I know nothing about this beer, but uh, as the, the Antonio Conte lookalike on the, <laughs> on the print <laughs> won me over. Great. Conte, as always, making it to the top of the podcast. So on the football, I think we're going to start off with Atalanta, who beat Fiorentina 3-0 at home. Um, well, it's not so much the game, but what's been going off on the, off the pitch. Uh, so just for anyone that, that didn't follow it, obviously Gasparini and Papa Gomez reportedly had a bit of a bust up at halftime in the game against FC, what was it? FC Midtjylland. Thanks for that, Michael. Um, and obviously the next day, the Italian press was reporting that Gasparini had offered his resignation. It kind of seemed like it had all been smoothed over until uh, today, didn't it, Kenny? Uh, well, y- yes and no. I-, I think from the from the comments after the game, I think after that that victory uh, against Ajax, Gomez sent out a, a, a message which tended to suggest that he was rubbishing the reports, saying, um, "You guys keep speaking, and we'll keep on." making history for this club, uh, referring to the fact that it's the, the, the second time that they've qualified for the the knockout stages of the, the Champions League. But there had been reports that the game was too big to leave Gomez out of and that he would be missing uh, from the weekend. And lo and behold, Gomez was left on the bench, didn't actually look too, too happy about that um, from the, the television pictures. Uh, and after the, after the game, Gasperini was obviously fielding questions uh, uh, about this, and he basically seemed to wash his hands of it a little bit and say, "Look, this is between the club and the player at this stage. If the player stays, then um, I, I, I will field the strongest team available to me." Uh, but Papu Gomez sent out a 
perhaps less cryptic message today. I think it was via Instagram. It was social media of some form saying, basically, I noticed Atlanta fans. Uh, I, I want to tell you my side of the story. This is the only place that I can I can do that. Um, you will hear wh- when I eventually do leave this club, you will hear all of the truth. Uh, you know who I am. Lots of love forever. Your captain, something along along those lines. It definitely sounds like those reports that came out last week, which sounded a lot like they could be rumors or making a mountain out of a molehill, might actually have been pretty close to the mark. So uh, worrying times for Atalanta, uh, I, I would say on on that front. Uh, but having said that, off off the back of that, they actually put in their best uh, Serie A performance in a while. And uh, it's worth noting that Gasperini took the ch- the occasion after the 3 nil victory to kind of um, possibly have a little dig at uh, Papu Gomez. He said that uh, the team were much more solid defensively and that currently they're managing to score lots of goals, which, uh, as I said, it's not so cryptic. Yeah, either way, it's a real shame, obviously. Um, Gomez has been a key part of the attacking force last season, at least. But, but what do we think? I mean, does, is there a chance he could leave the club in January? According to well, the, the implication is that, yes, he very possibly could. He has had a few opportunities over the years to to leave. Most recently this summer, I think, correct me if, I, if I've got this wrong, I think it was from... Al Nasser. Right, and they're from Qatar. Or is that... It was from the the Middle East somewhere, I think. Uh, a big, I think it was eight million euros. This is an uh, Italian football even. podcast. We we don't know about uh, other leagues at all. Clearly, yeah. Forgive my forgive my my ignorance, but it was a big money offer anyway, which he rejected. And there has there have been reports of tension between him and Gasparini before. I would really hope that it wouldn't end this way because I think Atalanta have done a lot for for Gomez. And I think Gomez himself has done a lot for Atalanta as well. It would be a really bitter way for for it to end because I think both Gasperini and Gomez have been kind of darlings in the eyes of Bergamaschi. Uh, in, in particular, Gasperini being given the the keys to to the city and Gomez being club captain and adored by the, by the fans. It would be really it would be really sad really for it for it to get, to end this way. I mean, it has to end at some point and. Uh, you would expect that Gasparini will have a succession plan in place, but you wouldn't want it to. You wouldn't want it to end this way, really. Absolutely not. And as Kenny said, both players, uh, uh, both Gasparini and Papu Gomez, are have been crucial to Atalanta's rise up the table and their Champions League run. Uh, but you have to say that if you had to give up on one or the other, probably losing one player as opposed to losing a manager whose whole identity has kind of changed the club is going to be an easier blow. And it seems like the club hierarchy have backed uh, Gasperini in this uh, little fight. Um, uh, just for anyone wondering, it's uh, Al Nasser FC is actually a Saudi Arabian football club. Saudi Arabian. Apologies for my ignorance. <laughs> no problem at all. Um, but yeah, I mean, you do have to wonder, especially later in the season, I know Gasparini likes to use a pretty small squad. You'd think that'd be be missing him, especially if their Champions League run continues. Yeah, and I think that's probably behind... In fact, if you look at um, both of the clubs, who we'll, we'll come on to Lazio in a bit, but both of the clubs in Serie A who have struggled to maintain the, the form of, of last season this year it is the two clubs in the Champions League who have the smaller squads and Atalanta are trying to transition. They've made a lot of signings, uh, and the only sort of main first team player that they lost was uh, Timoth- Timothy Castagne. They're trying to they're trying to do that, but that in itself is a challenge, I think, to integrate all of these players, and probably probably has a lot to do with where they find themselves just now. Sure. So um, to move on, but they've got a big game on Wednesday. So tomorrow, as you listen to it against Juventus. Um, obviously unlikely to see Gomez starting for that one, Kenny, but um, are you optimistic about Atlanta's chances in that? It's a, it's a really interesting game, actually. It's two teams that have been hot and cold from the start of the season. It's two teams that have put together two impressive results, really, uh, have strung together two, two convincing performances. This is going to be very interesting because if Atalanta win, then they're right back in the mix for 
the Champions League. If they lose, then it starts to look difficult. On the other hand, if Juventus lose, then that ground that they made up uh, on on Milan uh, this uh, this weekend could potentially evaporate, and uh, we could be talking about Juve being in uh, in trouble again. It's a really crazy season, actually. This is, I think, it's going to be a constant uh, throughout the coming months. Just the seesawing, the changing of narratives uh, overnight. Yeah, so a, a crucial game uh, for for both sides. And you mentioned uh, Juve, Juve kind of finally finally getting it right. Just before we move on to, to speaking about Juve a bit, we'll, we'll preview keeping up with the Italians uh, because Atalanta have drawn Real Madrid in the Champions League. Um, Baz, start your research. We'll be uh, maybe bringing back Hector, our Spanish correspondent, for that that segment. Is there a large McDonald's in Madrid? I need, I need to know now. <laughs> the largest in Spain, apparently. <laughs> Um, but on Juve, so at the weekend, they won 3-1 away to Genoa. It seems like they're, they're finally kind of getting it right in these easier games. We mentioned in the last episode that uh, Juventus had yet to win uh, uh, two games back-to-back in the Serie A, and uh, that task was now ticked off. Furthermore, the Juventus have now won eight in the last ten games. So uh, the, re- the results are starting to prove um, Pirlo right. On the other hand, the play is not yet up to standards, perhaps. They did suffer quite a lot against uh, Genoa, who are not doing particularly well this season. Uh, but overall, it was a good win for the collective. And the, the, perhaps the biggest takeaway was uh, Dybala goal, which um, was long awaited. And uh, Dybala had been having a bit of a shocker so far this season not including the fact that he would be out for about 47 days with COVID. So um, it was really nice to see that as soon as he scored, the players piled up on him and uh, the manager made made sure to speak about him in the, after, in the post-match interviews. So on that point, and also I should add that Morata, who was ostensibly left out for Dybala, was one of the first people to come up to him and hug him. Some great spirits shown by Juventus overall. Probably... Uh, starting to be on the right track after a fantastic victory in midweek against Barcelona away. Absolutely. Although I guess the only slight concerns, they needed Ronaldo again, um, scored two penalties, played 90 minutes. Uh, when the game stopped coming thick and fast, will he be available for all of these away fixtures against the lesser teams? I guess remains a, a little bit of a question mark, Kenny. Well, they needed Ronaldo from the penalty spot. So uh, the likelihood is that of, of two penalties... Another True. Player I mean, the, he played the, the whole game. One of them. What else do we want to say on Juve? Um, obviously, they smashed Barcelona 3-0 away to top their group, um, giving them an easier draw in the Champions League, or theoretically easier. That's uh, Porto for keeping up with the Italians, bars. looking forward to that. Yeah, we, we already have our uh, Portuguese correspondent, so we'll, I'll, be, I'll be glad to get back in touch. We'll take it... Um, take his coverage very seriously this time, any predictions he makes. I think one point to, to make on this, Boaz mentioned that uh, Juve did struggle a bit. They did they did struggle to to break down Genoa, but I think uh, on, on that point there of the, the Barcelona game, this is, for me, I think, the first time that we've seen two really convincing performances by Juve in a row. I mean, convincing victories. They, they they did struggle to to break down uh, Genoa, but undoubtedly there was only one team that was looking to to win that game, and in the end they did so uh, without too many without too many problems. And against Barcelona, what what a performance! So yeah, maybe we are beginning to see uh, Pirlo's Juve in action, albeit not not perfect yet. But you know, maybe things are falling into place stuff well all eyes on tomorrow night then in that case that's probably all the time we've got to talk about that game um we need to talk about milan who were disappointing for a change but as a 2-2 draw with Parma, and they've, as kenny said earlier they've dropped points here while all their rivals have won really uh, what went wrong here the woodwork mostly milan succeeded in hitting the woodwork four times in a row in the first half chalanoglu managed to hit the bar from a position that was much easier to hit the goal and overall, Milan's play was quite positive. Um, again, I think we mentioned this after the Verona game, but in the past, the Milan side that went even 1-0 down, but let alone 2-0 down, would have 
lost their uh, cool they would have uh, their heads would have gone down but instead Milan kept fighting back they played some really good football at least until the first goal went in and then once Parma played about 10 players in defense for the remaining 25 minutes Milan were piling up the pressure perhaps not being as uh, incisive as they could be but uh, overall um, a deserved draw at the very least and uh, I think the, one of the most indicative things from this game is the, um, the official Parma account, which is quite funny, actually. But they tweeted at uh, halftime, 1-0 to us. We're not sure how. So um, I think that says it all. But we said at the beginning of the season that we're not expecting Milan to win the league. Um, right now, the battle is with uh, wh- whomever is four in fifth position. And uh, w- with Lazio dropping points, at least in a week that... We were talking to each other before the games and we said it could be pivotal with Napoli, Juventus, uh, Inter, everyone picking a point. And uh, obviously this will look like two points dropped, but it's another good performance. And it's worth noting that, again, it was without uh, veterans like Kiai and Ibrahimovic and maybe their cool heads are missing right now. And uh, unfortunately, Benacer and Gabia were also pulled out with injuries. So this young Milan side is now looking very threadbare. Yeah, I, I just want to jump in with some one thing very quickly on that, which was uh, Boaz is maybe not believing in the uh, in the title charge, but uh, if we read into Pioli's post match comments, then maybe paints a, a different uh, story. He basically was asked uh, if he would sign up for fourth place now, and he said, "Would I sign up for fourth place? No. Would I sign up for second place? No." The only thing I'd sign up for now is is a new contract. But I think hinting there at the fact that he does maybe believe now uh, that this this could this could happen, and uh, who can blame him? The other thing that I wanted to say is we have to speak about Theo Hernandez, not just his two goals, but the fact that there were some incredible stats in the in the Gazette about him. He was the player who had the, the most shots on target. Uh, he was the player who created the most goal scoring opportunities. He was the player who touched the ball more than anyone else with, I think, uh, Chalanoglu or Chalanoglu uh, second. We talk about the you know the loss of Kjar. We talk about Ibrahimovic, the talisman, being out. But this is really a team now where we are seeing Teo Hernandez being one of them, some real superstars emerging. And yeah, I think that has to play into the, the, store, the uh, question of whether Milan are title challengers they're not just Zlatan and the rest uh, there, there are real superstars emerging in this team and perhaps to add weight to what Kenny just said um, 13 different players have scored for Milan this season this is considering that Rebic who's a stand, kind of a, supposed to be a striker he's not scored yet so there's a lot of uh, positive points and Ibrahimovic should be back either this midweek game against Genoa or by next weekend so at least we'll have our lion leader on the pitch yeah, and uh, Milan in the Europa League draw drew uh, Red Star Belgrade. So uh, another interesting one for our segment and um, looking forward to see how they get on in that. Uh, the last game we've got to talk about in this segment is uh, Bologna 1, Roma 5. Uh, I was watching this game with a slightly dodgy TV signal. I managed to miss, I think, not all of the goals, but at least three of the six goals were scored in the first half. So not quite sure how I managed that. I did did catch up on them all afterwards. A dodgy TV signal doesn't cut it anymore, Oscar. I think you need to own up to <laughs> <laughs> In the digital age, what does a dodgy TV signal mean? Well, it's um, for our listeners to, to get. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, obviously, amazing performance by Roma. Uh, goals coming from everywhere. Dzeko, there are two. I can't, can't remember who scored. But did Mkhitaryan was on the score sheet, I think? Yeah. Pellegrini yeah. and Zeko as well, and an own goal from Poli. Yeah, I, I mean the own goal that Cristante scored uh, for Bologna was one of the most ridiculous own goals I've seen. I su- suggest maybe <laughs> our listeners are maybe familiar with the Gagliardini challenge of missing open goals. Maybe we should have a Cristante challenge for the most ridiculous own goal. I like that. It's re- <laughs> just really, really silly. Yeah, Bologna were awful, weren't they? Oh, Roma were great. Not taking anything away from them, but uh, yeah, Bologna. Yeah, were they awful. tried to play a high line. And just like a mistimed offside trap, we're just letting them absolutely rub by it. All too easy. All too easy. I mean, it's obviously just a testament to how tight it still is at the top. Romo obviously 
had a few dodgy results recently, but they're still very much in the mix for the Champions League places, if not the, the title. And they've drawn uh, Braga in Europe. Um, so a return for their manager, Paolo Fonseca, who was manager there 2015 to 2016. Looking forward to keeping up the Italian section on that. And uh, before we end on this game, we really have to put in a few hard words for Bologna, who really looked like they were they were not on the pitch for this game. This is a home game, it should be added. And um, we're usually very complimentary for Sinisa Mihailovic, but um, the way the team was out on the field is... Reflected, it reflects the manager, and in, I think in the Gazeta they were they had an average rating of four point five. So shocking performance, and um, Siniza Mihailovic has now put them in retiro until Christmas, so they won't be seeing their families for a while. Yeah, one of a, a few clubs this weekend to be going. That's cruel. Around this time, yeah, this is a slightly strange Italian tradition. I, I was not aware of. I assume probably our listeners will be. It doesn't happen anywhere else, really. Maybe in Spain. So if but... the team's underperforming, they're just kind of taken away on a bit of a jolly. But they're it's not locked very off jolly. and some <laughs> elaborate stag do. Famously, recently, with uh, Ancelotti's Napoli towards the end of his tenure there was uh, a, a big deal. But yeah, Torino have also uh, gone into Ritiro and the other side... Fiorentina. Fiorentina, Yeah. It'd be quite funny if they were all in the same area. Like, oh, there's, the, there's the guys from Torino. Naughty, you'd, naughty. You'd imagine there would be some logistical challenges in COVID times uh, to, to do this. But maybe not. Maybe it makes it easier. Maybe, yeah, it uh, might be even better. Yeah. They don't meet anyone else. Lots of free hotels. And yeah. Yeah, it makes a difference, I suppose, from the warm weather training camps that we hear about in the UK or the Premier League teams off to Dubai. Yeah, it's like a really shit equivalent of that, let's be honest. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they should travel north, come to Finland and do that. It's pure punishment. <laughs> Ice baths. Yeah. Can hook them up. All uh, right, that's definitely what we've got time for in this segment. Um, we're just uh, a couple of honorable and dishonorable mentions, and uh, we will leave you. Uh, so, Baz, first of all, an honorable from you to Crotona. It's a game we probably won't get to mention too much, but uh, Crotone finally got their first uh, win of the season and they beat uh, fellow newcomers Spezia for one, kind of showing them who finished about, who finished top last season. And also uh, it's worth noting that Spezia seemed a little bit um, a little bit too flamboyant. They were a little bit too confident considering that, they're, as we said, they both just came up from Serie B. So well done to Crotone. Uh, they probably deserved a win before this, so... It's good to see them get points on the board. Good stuff. And Kenny, it just says here, Maldini rats out Pirlo. What's this about? <laughs> yeah, to be honest, any excuse that I can get to get Paolo Maldini into the, the podcast is a is a good one. Uh, on, Amen. The, on, on the day that he was named the the, the best left back of, of all time. But yes, uh, so this one is, it refers to a comment that, well, it was actually the television broadcast uh, in which Maldini was speaking to to Pirlo and and after the the interview, Maldini revealed that he had uh, spoken to Pirlo when Pirlo was first off given the under twenty three position at Juve, and apparently Maldini said something along the lines of, "Are you really just coming to to coach the under twenty threes? Be honest, you're you're taking over the first team, aren't you?" But he was quite obviously fishing. Uh, to which Pirlo replied, "How the hell do you know?" and uh, yeah, that's how Maldini discovered before anybody else that Pirlo was being lined up uh, to to take over the role. So yeah, honourable mention for uh, Maldini, the investigative journalist there. The new PI, seriously. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> um, we obviously feeling in sort of festive spirits because um, no dishonourables in this part. We've got another honourable from you, Baz, for uh, Kalulu. Kalulu is a young French uh, 20-year-old defender that Milan purchased in the summer. And um, as we mentioned earlier, Matteo Gabbia got injured after about two minutes. So the youngster was thrown in and he's actually a right back, but uh, he played center back and he was really impressive. Great coming out with the ball at his feet. A few great anticipations and to, to consider the fact that this was his first Serie A game ever, uh, he deserves an a honorable mention from me. Good stuff. And Kenny, we talked about um, Dybala's goal earlier, um, but in connection with that, you've got an honourable for Morata. 
Yeah, oh, well, but actually, this isn't for for Morata. Boaz already mentioned that the fact that he was uh, on the bench uh, in order to allow Dybala to start, but he was the first one to come out and uh, hug him, congratulate him for what was a wonderful uh, goal. But this one actually for Bonucci, really. Um, we spoke about him last week or the week before, basically uh, for reprimanding, taking a leadership position and reprimanding his team saying that this wasn't good enough basically this is the other side of that coin uh, and it's the fact that he was actively inciting a team pile on on uh, on Dybala so yes but Boaz said great great team spirit great to see um, to see him leading that and all the best to Dybala because he's had a very very tough time as Boaz mentioned the covid uh, and then lack of form, and in the interview after the game, Dybala basically admitted that his confidence is shot, and he hopes that this kind of helps him, helps him get back. And uh, it's good to have leaders like Bonucci uh, around you to kind of help build that back up. Lovely stuff. Looking forward to seeing uh, Dybala in a Spurs shirt in uh, February. <laughs> <laughs> um, and just to wrap up this segment, Boaz. Um, this is a bit of a stra- Is this an honourable or a dishonourable for Palmer's Jordan Osorio? I'm not sure. You know, I'm I'm, I'm on the border <laughs> with this one, but but either way, Palmer's uh, Jordan Osorio. Um, he looks like he's constantly about to burst out in tears. He got booked in the 43rd minute for the Milan game, and I mean, it, it was a, it could have been a booking. It wasn't that contentious, but he looked like he was miserable about it. And I was thinking, wow, this guy is like taking this booking really seriously. But then, like, the second half started, and on every corner, he has the same face. When he's got the ball at his feet, he has the same face. He's just generally very upset with life. Oh, Cheer up, man. Resting upset face. Fair enough. All right, that's all we've got time for in part one. We'll be right back. Hello, City A fan. Make Scudetto a part of your weekly football fix. Subscribe now on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite listening platform, and follow us on Twitter. Facebook and Instagram at Scudetto Pod. We'd love to have you on the squad. Welcome back to part two. Plenty to get through in this half, but first let's check in on the beers. Baz, we cho- did we choose wisely for you? Yeah, we said this beer was uh, the the label looked a bit like Antonio Conte, and I have to say that the beer is a bit like Antonio Conte. It's it starts <laughs> off like early season Antonio Conte. It hits you softly, a lot of fruity flavors, very nice, very kind. But then it turns into nasty Antonio Conte, and it kicks you. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm enjoying this beer. I'm, I'm probably gonna have it again. I think by this point we've lost all the any Inter fan who listens to this podcast is unsubscribed. Every, any Inter fan who listens to this podcast agrees with us with us fully. Possibly. Yeah. I was gonna, I was gonna say we forgot to say the good stuff about Inter. We haven't actually talked about their game yet this week, but uh, <laughs> we are going to. There's good um, stuff to say about Inter. There's good stuff to say about Inter. There is. Stick around, Inter fans. Kenny, how's your beer? Yes, th- there's good things to say about this beer as well, actually. It's lovely, very nice beer, uh, very hoppy, quite strong. So forgive me if I don't make too much sense in this part. Good stuff. I'm afraid we have to start again with more sad news for Italian football. Obviously, last week we were discussing the passing of Diego Maradona and um, the tribute that all of the Italian clubs paid to him. And uh, it was, again, this week... Uh, Lovely to see all of the uh, a minute silence before all of the games for Paolo Rossi, who passed away at 64. Uh, World Cup winner, Golden Boot, Gold Ball, and Ballon d'Or winner. Absolute national hero in Italy, really. Really sad news. Uh, Kenny, what's your kind of uh, memory of Paolo Rossi growing up in Italy? Yeah, well, this is obviously a huge, a huge blow, a very, very sad, uh, very sad day for, for Italian football. And to, to be totally honest, uh, Rossi was very slightly before before my time. Uh, I mentioned when we were speaking about uh, Maradona that uh, I moved to Italy in 1986, which was um, the, the end of Rossi's career, really. But you don't grow up in Italy being, especially as a football fan, not knowing who Paolo Rossi was, an absolute icon. I mean, he was 1982. He was the Italian uh, World Cup hero. Uh, and really, just his, his story was one of uh, of redemption. 
he had a, a period in the in the seventies, obviously, where he was banned from from football for for alleged uh, match fixing, which he absolutely uh, denied. He had his his ban cut from from three years to two years, and he, he said that he was just the wrong guy in the wrong place, basically, when conversations were were um, happening, uh, and even considered giving up on football altogether. But after after returning to to football, he had the the golden period of of his career where he won uh, he won Scudetti, Champions League, uh, oh sorry, uh, European Cup, uh, the World Cup was Ballon d'Or winner. Um, yeah, an absolute uh, absolute icon. Uh, very very sad story. I know that all of Italian football is going to miss him very much. And Boaz, I think you had something to share that uh, Roberto Baggio had written uh, about Paolo Rossi's passing. Um, Roberto Vaggio wrote a very long eulogy in the Gazzetta dello Sport, um, but one of the most touching stories was that him, Roberto Vaggio and his dad used to ride 12 kilometers on in their bikes just to get to Vicenza to see Paolo Rossi play. This is the kind of status Paolo Rossi had in Italian football. It has to be said that in contrast to Diego Maradona, who had a lot of uh, off-field controversy and part of his legend is his uh, personality, the story with the match fixing with Paolo Rossi is uh, really out of character. And overall, he was considered a, a gentleman and someone who very much uh, very loyal to his teammates and very uh, trustworthy. And it has to be said that um, it's it really the, that 1982 World Cup is shows how far we are from that football today in the sense that for a start, um, you know the games were be- the games were being played, and it's not like everyone was watching them in their houses, but rather people were watching them in the piazza in Italy, and thousands of people were gathering. And I guess like all these major tournaments, it united the nation. But also, Paolo Rossi started the the tournament and didn't score in the group stages. And you know nowadays with social media, you probably have someone like drop Rossi hashtag uh, Rossi out stuff like that. And um, the obviously the media was came out against him he he was unfit following the match ban and he'd only really played about two games but um what a run he had to the final he scored a hat trick against brazil two against germany and one in the final and um i mean that's a fantastic record and that puts him in the legend and from a personal point of view i as a very young child i i never really connected the fact that they called him pablito rossi because he won the world cup in Spain, I just assumed this guy was called Pablito in Italy, and it, it struck me as a bit weird, but um, yeah, his name is Paolo Rossi, and they changed it to Pablito because he was a hero in Spain. Lovely story there, um, and obviously another casualty of 2020, very sad news, Buzz. Something else to say? And we mentioned Roberto Baggio earlier, and uh, we have to say that uh, Paolo Rossi, along with Roberto Baggio and Christian Vieira, are the all-time top goal scorers for the Azzurri at the World Cup. I think those are all three legendary players in their own uh, eras, and uh, Paolo Rossi doesn't stand, that, does not uh, look out of place on that list. As we've discussed before, the kind of player that um, Italy are really missing at the moment. Uh, Definitely, what my answer you like to say? Um, yeah, as I said, just uh, really, really sad news. Another casualty of this year, um, but lovely to um, see the tributes of all the clubs. We'll move on now to the football. So starting in Napoli, who beat Sampdoria 2-1, um, we said earlier they're making up a bit of ground on Milan. But as you wanted to pick out the performance of Lozano in particular in this game. There is a, a fine line between a manager being a genius for making uh, the correct subs and possibly not being such a genius for picking the wrong side to begin with. In either case, uh, Gattuso and Napoli as a whole didn't play too well in the first half. They went 1-0 down to a Sampdoria side who, as we mentioned um, a few a few episodes ago, have only won two points from their last 15 available. And uh, at halftime, Gattuso switched it up. He brought on the fridge Petania and he brought on uh, Lozano. And uh, Lozano was pretty much in 45 minutes player of the match. He set up one of the goals and he scored one of the goals and he also hit the post. And generally, um, it again showed that Napoli have great strength and depth, but also that... Uh, Gattuso is willing to adapt his uh, ideas, his methods, and uh, switch up where is ne- where it's necessary. And another side note that was that this is, was the first official Serie A game at the Diego Armando Maradona Stadium after a midweek game against Sociedad was the first official official game. The first official Serie A game was it? 
So this was the official Serie A game, and the previous one was the first first game. Makes sense. Um, yeah, just on that point of squad depth, uh, some good news for uh, Napoli today that Victor Simon won't need surgery, and there's a chance he might be back before Christmas. Um, so uh, all obviously big fans of him on this podcast. And he's vital to their gameplay. He gives them uh, an extra dimension. Absolutely. Um, he probably won't be back for the midweek games. Uh, they're playing against Inter uh, on Wednesday night. Uh, and we'll talk about Inter in a second. Anything else that we want to say about Napoli or Sampdoria first? Well, keeping up with the Italians, uh, another little uh, name drop from my favorite segment, but uh, we're going to Granada. So uh, we'll be happy to, for that. <laughs> yeah, we need to find a different Spain correspondent maybe for that one. Another one, just to, just to highlight that had uh, circumstances been different and Napoli had travelled to Juventus at a time that they were uh, very much <laughs> struggling, they would now be joint with Milan at the top of the table had they taken uh, three points from, from that game. So uh, I, I think crazily a couple of weeks ago, some Napoli fans were questioning Ginalino Gattuso, but they could be, um, if circumstances were different, sitting joint top of Serie A at the moment. Yeah, that situation, just the further you get from it, the more bizarre it it looks really, doesn't it? I guess at the time, there's just so much strange stuff going on and the football being back was so new that maybe bypassed just a little bit, but really strange. Anyway, um, as I said, they're playing into tomorrow night and we've promised Inter fans some, some positive courage, coverage on this podcast. They beat Cagliari 3-1 away um, and Christian Eriksen was in the starting lineup. So Yeah, you got uh, a whole 53 minutes, which is um, <laughs> about uh, 49 minutes more. more than it gets usually. <laughs> yeah, Inter, were, were by, by all accounts, were uh, outstanding. Uh, a great response to, to a very disappointing uh, midweek Situation in in Europe and their form in Serie A cannot be questioned over these last few weeks. So perhaps it's uh, time for the naysayers uh, to, yeah, to to revisit their the the doom mongering um, of a, a few weeks back. And I definitely cut myself in that as well. I initially picked them out as my favourites to to win the Scudetto and. Uh, Obviously, it, to my shame, wrote them off uh, just a few weeks into into the season um, when they were being Pazza Inter. But they're yeah, they're really hitting some form, and uh, it's yeah, it's it's tightening up. And maybe it's going to help them uh, not having the extra games to play. Maybe they're lucky to to miss out on Europa League. Obviously, when they're eliminated from the Champions League in fourth position, what do you think, Bert? It goes without saying that not qualifying from a group that seemed pretty easy on paper at least, um, is a catastrophic failure from uh, Inter. And also it's a financial issue because uh, they're going to lose out on about 20 million euros, if I'm not mistaken. Paradoxically, not having to worry about uh, European football will benefit Conte. And as we know, Conte's track record is much more domestic than European or international. Obviously, getting to train with the players uh, for a full week making sure that they prepare and maybe even having a plan B once in a while uh, could benefit them. I, I I would counter that by saying that European football is quite a way off. There's a lot of football to be played between now and February when uh, the Europa League and Champions League start up again. Everyone's in the same boat until then. They've been doing very, very well, but they've got a huge, that's an absolutely huge game against Napoli. We've already spoken about what, where Napoli could potentially have been were it not for uh, the forfeiting of that Juve game. So it's a big, big challenge for, for Conte's men. And if they if they lose that, they could potentially find themselves further behind Milan uh, than they were before this weekend. So that's just the first game of those very, very many games. There's a lot of football to be played before we start speaking about this, benefiting them. Uh, if they're still in the mix come February, then yes. But uh, they need to keep this form up, really, to to you know make that even part of the equation. Because uh, early part of this season, first six or seven games, they were too hot and cold. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, the other thing we're going to talk about relating to Inter is uh, Lukaku. Um, obviously, scored a great goal against Cagliari. Um, sort of picked the ball up on the halfway line, rounded the keeper, smashed it in from two yards out. Oh, show. 
show of what you can do. Um, and um, just to highlight a piece that's been talked about a lot on Twitter uh, that Carl Anker of The Athletic wrote, I think, um, saying that Lukaku's often overlooked should be talked about as one of the best strikers in the world, uh, which I find difficult to argue with, really. Perhaps he is overlooked, one, because obviously he's black and two, because he's playing in Italy. And possibly also that he didn't succeed in England and or on paper he didn't succeed in England and therefore some fans are quick to dismiss him. But um, as we all generally agreed, f- football is a lot more than just what's happening on the British Isles. Lukaku has shown both in his form for his national team, but also in the last couple of years in Italy, that he's a lethal striker and the things he does, no, I think very few other players do. Perhaps with the exception of Lewandowski for Bayern, I don't, I can't think of any other more lethal striker. Yeah, and I, I said last week that he was one of the best strikers in Europe for me. And that probably makes him, given the amount of money that there is in Europe and the fact that that lures the best players from around the world, probably makes him one of the best strikers in the world. He possibly is the best, uh, the best striker in the world. Uh, this is something that often gets said is that to be considered the best, you have to win the top international prizes. Uh, so uh, whether that's at club level or uh, for your nation, uh, that's something that perhaps he, he will need to do before being uh, being on the level with Lewandowski, but undoubtedly absolutely sensational striker. Um, and yeah, yeah, I'm sure he does get overlooked a lot. You mentioned uh, Ericsson earlier. Yeah, Lukaku could have really done him a big favor if he had scored uh, off his lovely no-look pass. As it happened, Lukaku hit the keeper and Ericsson had a pretty lackluster game, um, perhaps proving Conte right. But if that goal had gone in, we'd be talking about a completely different narrative and possibly a newborn Ericsson. Yeah, it's a shame we won't get to see either of them in the Champions League this season. <laughs> and and Conte's got a new uh, a new song now. He's talking about having to get rid of players, which is a it's completely the opposite of what he was saying last season. He's rumored to want to get rid of Nyangolan, who's hardly seen the pitch, and uh, Vecino as well. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if Eriksson was would also leave in this um, in January window. Yeah, the Gazetta had them in there. They had uh, four players. Uh, Who's the Eriksson. fourth? Ericsson. Um, it doesn't spring to mind at the moment. But, hmm. um, that guy. Maybe we can tweet it. That's a reason Perfect. for people to follow us on Twitter. Follow us on Twitter. Engage with yeah. us. Stuff at Scudetto Pod, that is. For anyone that doesn't <laughs> know. <laughs> so we do need to talk about Lazio, who uh, lost away. Oh, sorry, they lost at home to Verona 2-1. Having a bit of a strange season, Lazio. Uh, they've obviously qualified second in their Champions League group, although albeit probably one of the easier groups, and have just drawn by it in the in the last sixteen. Yeah, that's that's painful. Uh, but uh, they were lackluster against Verona. Buzz, did you watch this one? So Lazio had a bit of a strange week. It has to be said. First of all, and um, producer Ken is going to have to beat me out here, but <laughs> they pretty much uh, themselves. Um, in the European game, they, all they had to do was get a draw at home. Their opponents were down to 10 men and still managed to hit the bar. And it was, there was a few um, very nervous moments for Lazio. In the end, they qualified for the Champions League for the first time in 20 years, which is uh, worthy. But it felt like um, in this game against Verona, they were carrying some sort of a European hangover. And perhaps Lazio were missing the fantasy of Luis Alberto, but it has to be said that both uh, Verona goals come from uh, clear mistakes from Lazio players who kind of committed the uh, harakiri, if you if you want to say it. Firstly, Radu with a crazy back pass that allowed Tameze to score, but also Lazari scoring an own goal. In between, Casiedo scored, uh, managed to get an equalizer. Again, Lazio seemed to be lacking a team outside of their starting eleven. We said it at the beginning of the season that they probably didn't buy too well. And I think uh, in the long run, it's going to come back to bite them. And I'd like to give a special mention to Simone Inzaghi, who was quoted just a few days ago as saying, whoever draws Lazio in the Champions League uh, will not be happy. And uh, obviously, they drew European champions uh, Bayern Munich, <laughs> which is <laughs> not too reassuring. Um, the first thing I did when I saw that draw is text my fellow pod mates and, and said, ouch, this Lazio going out. 
They might not be happy, but they certainly won't be particularly intimidated. I wouldn't have thought. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, two things for 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 me to say on this. I think I, I mentioned it before with Atalanta, Lazio, or the other the other club, uh, obviously who have got a small squad. Really, when you look at players who would be first first picks, uh, it's normally quite easy to pick your your strongest eleven uh, for for Lazio, uh, and that obviously becomes difficult when you're playing back to back games the other one is that we have to we have to give credit to to Verona not just for their performance in this game but Verona have drawn against Juventus and Milan and now beaten Atalanta and Lazio and it's incredible when you look at that squad um at the start of the season they lost Amrabat they lost Kumbula Pessina went back to the Atalanta and I, I hold my hands up. I'm not sure if I said it on a on a live pod or or not, or whether it was in one of our in one of our sort of pilot episodes. But I looked at Verona and thought, yeah, they had a great season, uh, the first season up. But they've lost a lot of loan players. They've lost a lot of key players. Uh, they're gonna they're gonna struggle. And Juric is doing an absolutely fantastic job there. So. Yet another uh, impressive result for them, and probably the on current form the last t- team that any any club with European commitments would want to face uh, after having after having played uh, in Europe. Uh, so yeah, just to to uh, give them credit for their part in the result as well. And a special mention has to go out to Verona's goalkeeper Marco Silvestri who uh, literally was a one-man wall against uh, Lazio's onslaught in the last 10 minutes or so. Some ridiculous saves, and possibly he was man of the match, despite them winning 2-1. Yeah, he, for me, is one of the one of the best keepers in Serie A. He's uh, yeah, absolutely great, great goalkeeper. Absolutely worth crediting Verona, who um, actually go above Lazio with this win, up to 7th. Uh, with 19 points, so maybe European ambitions of their own. Last game, we're just going to briefly touch on uh, Torino lost again uh, away to Udinese. Uh, we mentioned earlier that they're off to the uh, Italian boot camp. The Ritiro, uh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> aye, aye, aye. Uh, so they uh, came back aye, from 2-0 yeah. down and, and managed to, f- to throw it away. Um <sighs> It's just if you were a Torino fan right now, just you'd be pulling your hair out. They, they get themselves in such good positions and then just seem to yeah just collapse. It's worrying, worrying. And it's self-inflicted. Yeah. Well, maybe we'll talk more about them in a future episode. Uh, that's all we've got time for in part two. Uh, just a quick moment for the honourable and dishonourable mentions. Uh, Kenny, you've got one for Barella to kick us off. Yeah, so this is uh, something we've seen from Barella before, but his his technique for Inter's equaliser was absolutely incredible. Uh, the way he yeah just picked a ball out that seemingly was in no danger at all, and just uh, anyone who's played the game knows how difficult it is to. Uh, they say get your knee over the ball, but when you're at that angle, you can't really do that. Uh, and the power that he got behind it, absolutely fantastic. Uh, and, and I would encourage, I would urge any young uh, aspiring football footballers to watch that and uh, just try and replicate it. And while we're actually on the subject of technique, one for young Ricardo Sotil too, uh, son of Andrea Sotil, who um, played for many, many clubs, but in particular spent a lot of time at Atalanta and Udinese um, for his perfect, perfect volley in that game against uh, 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 that game against the Inter. And I think Conte himself gave him, gave him uh, kudos for that one. Uh, and for Caicedo, who, his effort Boaz mentioned, uh, briefly pulled Lazio Back on level terms with Verona, but just a wonderful, wonderful spinning snapshot from from the edge of the box against Verona. Great stuff. I love I love goals like that. Yeah, good to celebrate all the volleys the week in the uh, honourable mention section. Boaz, you've got one for uh, is it Inzaghi's son? First of all, uh, I'll quickly touch on uh, Kenny's mention of Barella because it was also the classic goal de Lex. And uh, so he was caught in that weird spot where he's not sure if he's going to celebrate or apologize or do both. And there's no one in the stadium as well. So who are you apologizing to? 
fair point. But um, I have to give a uh, honorable mention. Uh, we we mentioned earlier that uh, Bologna were utterly smashed by Roma. The one good note in that whole debacle was that uh, Mattia Pagliuca made his debut. Uh, Matteo Pagliuca, for those who don't know, is uh, Gianluca's son, uh, who is a uh, Azzurri goalkeeper. And also actually was the goalkeeper for Bologna between 99 and 2006. Ironically, his son makes his debut 5,313 days after his dad retired. Uh, okay, and, and now the Inzaghi sons, perhaps? Just, uh, it's always nice to see when uh, Simone and Pippo play each other and uh, Benevento Lazio will meet this week. And uh, I think we mentioned in our first episode of the season that their dad got really emotional at the start of the season. So I'm not really sure how he's going to cope when their their teams meet. Yeah, it could be an awkward Christmas, um, assuming that they're allowed to meet up. Um, and Kenny, I said that um, Torino Udinese was the one game we hadn't spoken about. It's actually uh, not true. Uh, you've got a quick honourable from the Sassuolo game. Uh, yeah, Sassuolo back on uh, on on winning uh, ways, really. Uh, and thanks to a fantastic, uh, a fantastic match winning and acrobatic reflex save at the death from Consigli to to hold on against Benevento. Sassuolo obviously went down to to ten men, uh, and we talk a lot about the glory of uh, of the the volleys and the the, the winning goals, but. Equally important, the saves that that you know allow teams to hold on to to these points, and that really was worth watching. Uh, definitely check it out if you haven't seen it. Uh, check it out on on the uh, Serie A YouTube channel. It's well worth digging out. Definitely will do. And I've got an honourable for. I think maybe we gave an honourable already to Kevin Prince Botang, who's obviously just joined the uh, Monza, so he's a going concern in Italian football. Um, he's joined the hashtag Messi to Napoli posse. Obviously a listener. Oh, yeah, I'm not sure if he used the hashtag, but he's certainly <laughs> been, uh, been on talking uh, to ESPN, social media. So he's talking uh, to ESPN. He's bringing it to the masses. Yeah, making it known that he thinks that uh, Messi should end his career in tribute to Diego so um, fair play to him I think he also suggested that Messi should play for, for no salary or something did he not Boaz? he basically said that money wouldn't be an issue for Messi to just come to Napoli and say I'm here I mean I, I enjoy these what ifs it's great what about you is great from Kevin Prince uh, yeah so no comment on uh, whether Messi ought to accept that an, an offer in that region but Boaz you've got a dishonourable for some thieves yeah, I mean, let's give a dishonorable to thieves all around the world in general. But in this <laughs> particular case, where we just spoke about uh, Pablito Rossi. And uh, while his uh, funerals were taking place, um, some people broke into his house and stole his watch and a few things. And that's that's really low. Come on, guys. Yeah. yeah disgraceful. Um, but let's end on a positive note. Uh, an honorable for uh, Regione. Yeah, he's a very brave man. Um Kievo defender Rigione was uh, interviewed post-match and he said, um, I'd like to thank my parents. I'd like to thank my b- siblings who have um, who had COVID. I'd like to thank my daughters. And above all, and I'd also like to thank my wife, even though she pissed me off this week. <laughs> At which point the interviewer asked, why did she piss you off? And he's like, you know, like all wives, she pissed me off. He'll be sleeping on the couch for a few weeks and um, that's it. Yeah, solid. <laughs> I did, I did know what to say it's not good, is it? <laughs> yeah, I mean, maybe you can say that he misspoke. Maybe it starts off so well as well, <laughs> like they had COVID. <laughs> my parents, my kids, <laughs> it's like my wife who pissed me off. <laughs> What's wrong with you? Like, why would you say that? You just forgot the media training for a second, and he smiles no, all think- through it. He's like, "Oh my god!" Anyways. <laughs> anyway, honourable mention to him. I'm afraid that is all we've got time for this week. Please do subscribe to our podcasts on uh, Apple Podcasts or Spotify, wherever you get your audio. We'll speak to you next week with the uh, final episode of the year. Until then, enjoy the football. <laughs> Per la stagione 2000, 2001.